outside, that is way outside my comfort zone. <clears throat> All right, so let's get started here. All right, so there are a couple of questions that started showing up on Slack before class today. So I wanted to answer those first to make sure everyone's on the same page. Um, again, I'm expecting most of the planning to take place outside of the class. At, um, and so I'm just trying to make sure I answer questions that you have generically. Uh, and then uh, I'll let you guys proceed from there. So reminder, the meeting is going to be not this weekend, but next weekend, Saturday afternoon. Um, at one o'clock will be uh, all department, actually all four, um, worship session. So CS Engineering Physics will all participate in that all years, freshmen through seniors. Um, and then after that's done, then the sophomores and juniors can do whatever um, after that they want to do. Well, they, I mean, it's optional for them to come anyways. Um, but the ones that come can, can return back to their dorms or, or I guess stick around. Um, and the uh, seniors will then give their advice session to the freshmen. Um, and the expectation there is that it'll take around 90 minutes. Um, my experience is that I normally have to cut this session off in the, the full retreat because the, the uh, freshmen have lots of questions. If you've been looking through the list of questions, thank you for collating them, um, Daisy. And then uh, who, who um, started collating them uh, or, or organizing a little bit more? Kendall, thank you, both of you. Um, uh, so that's a lot of questions. Um, there's there's definitely duplication in there, um, but uh, they've got a lot of things that they don't know about, um, and and they see you as kind of the the expert of how to be the best computer science student that that they aspire to be. So um, there's there's lots of things that you can talk about. And once you start talking, it will stimulate additional questions that they haven't even submitted um, to, to me um, in, in whatever format you do. So just kind of plan for, for 90 minutes there. Um, after that, then um, I, I just expect it to kind of dissipate. I might bring out some, some board games or stuff if people want to hang around and, and do stuff together, but there's not an expect expectation or obligation at that point that, that you have to stay. So, um, oh, you know, that means like roughly one to four-ish uh, if you include transition time and so forth between those two activities. So that's kind of what you should plan on for, for that time. Um, yeah, are there other questions about that activity? As far as I know, only one of you has contacted me with a conflict. So that means that the rest of you are planning on being there. Uh, if that is not true, you need to contact me immediately so that I can make sure that um, you know equivalent things happen. Yes, Juan. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, let's transition then a little bit so I can stand and not have to sit. Those of you who've been in my office know I have a standing desk. Sitting, sitting has become uncomfortable for me. Just the, like I can't watch a movie with my family anymore. That's, that's uncomfortable to sit on a couch for, for that length of time. Uh, so, uh, Okay, um, so uh, the first thing I wanted to talk about um, is uh, chapter five from, from your book. Um, I was able to look at some of your uh, responses. If, if you sent it in before, say, the last half hour, 45 minutes, uh, 
because when, when I last looked at them. Um, and of those ones I looked at, it seemed like a lot of you um, resonated with uh, the, the, the major theme uh, of, the, of this chapter. So I have some things that I want to say, but I, before I do that, um, I wanted to hear um, uh, in what ways you felt that you most resonated uh, with, with this chapter. Yeah, you know. I I wasn't sure if we were the work, but I think this chapter is a good read. I feel like if you really know this, it's not going to get about how the college was doing in the budget and the business and et cetera. Meaning that after college, there's just no big deal in the business. Um, and I think that was really, really my thinking you know, about like I've been in this team, I've been in the work and so we've been. Um, but also, because I've around that so much and I've had an impact for two and a half years, I think if you continue to think that my best friends I will have have to be in the history of life with me, mm -hmm. it's maybe one of the best conversations to be. But if you're urging us to make this or something that's new, a really good stuff is like a failure or not. If you were just stepping on the table, you like to serve the then you can do it really good. Mm -hmm. so what else? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, the chapter definitely really resonated with me as well, just because that's kind of been my main post college fear. Okay. Like I, I know I'm going to be moving out to the DC area, I've got a job already. I, I don't know anyone out there. And it's a very different feel from being uh, at a place like Taylor that I've called home for a while. I have a lot of close friends. Uh, and, I, and I think what she was saying about community not being hated to you is especially true for us because Taylor is so community oriented. Like if we're at a public university, that might not be quite as much of a transition because it's not quite the same feel. Um, but the advice that she had that really resonated with me was sort of the, the intentionality that you have to have, like you have to be proactive and in a way aggressive about trying to seek out community and friends and, and finding your place because if you don't, like it's just gonna it's just gonna pass you by. There aren't those those safeguards. So hearing hearing that it's a, a common thing kind of gave me a little bit of peace mm. uh, and having that advice in my back pocket uh, is definitely encouraging going forward. Mm. Yeah, no, you can be back, you know, because of like all the community centers like here in college or here or back in high school. So I, I never thought about really that like all of even since elementary school, I've been surrounded by community of my own age group. And so in the real world that really is not the case. Mm -hmm. so that's that's something I'm really encouraging. We might be in a slightly different position in the technology field because it is such um the book I'm assigning the freshmen this year, make them well known. It's not that book, but um, it, it has a connection that just demonstrates that because the, the rate of change in our field, or the rate of growth, I should say, rather than rate of change, the amount of new things that are happening are that that you're, you're constantly adding new people so much that even if people don't leave the field, you have so many new incoming entry level people that it always is going to look like it's a young field. And that's if you don't have anyone leaving the, the field because you have so many more students and more students and more students entering in, into the field. So, um, you know, we're in technology and uh, computing fields, we're definitely in that kind of like, oh, it's a younger field, right? And people will sometimes claim, you know, that they, you can't make it as if you're older because you know, there's, there's a, a implicit or explicit bias against people who are older. Like they can't, they're not nimble, they can't be agile with, with new technologies or whatever. Um, so there's, there's that all that, that mentality. But even so, it's not limited to one or two years. It's still going to be a larger range of, of people than, than you've experienced primarily uh, up through. 
Files. Yeah, uh, I also appreciated her mention of like the, the Timothy Paul and Silas uh, analogy, having like that person who's gone ahead of you, that person coming behind you, and that person kind of right beside you. So kind of talking about like what we've mentioned earlier, of, like having friends that are just kind of in our uh, age group, like definitely pushing ourselves to look for someone to pour into us, but also looking for someone younger that we can pour into and serve in that manner. Um, yeah, I think that's just a, that helps me think about community in a slightly more vertical way instead of a horizontal way. Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. I, I also really like how Sasha talked about like the dynamic she called it this week about like enlightening people and how like they act as like entering the community stage. Just kind of this notion that like it's okay that sometimes people are important to people and vice versa. And it's okay to recognize that like your quality and expectation change by your account and like the right and that's what we learn. So just to like expect them to be different. Okay. Yeah. Um to give kind of another, uh, I guess, um, meat to, to, to that idea, um, I know for, for many of you, you're, you're either, um, you've been at or you're anticipating being at weddings, whether the, that's your, your own or, or friends that you've been here. And, um, and, you know, I was just thinking as I was uh, thinking of this chapter of, of my own wedding and the people who I asked to stand in my wedding. And I didn't get married immediately after that failure. I was um, 28 when my wife and I got married. Um, and so, so there's hope for all of you who are, uh, don't have to panic with green by spring or anything like that. Um, but uh, we'll get that in a later chapter. Um, but, the, but the point I'm, I'm trying to make is I was thinking about the people in my wedding and the connections I have to them now. And the only people that I maintain a connection with that were actually, you know, I asked to stand as, as groomsmen or my wife asked to stand as bridesmaids um, in the wedding are my brothers, my brother and sister and her brother and sister. Everyone else we've lost contact with, um, and those are supposed to be like the most significant, meaningful relationships that that I um, that we had with, with, with people at, at that time. So it's definitely um, it, it definitely changes for sure. Yeah, I think that's a good For me, the, this was this was probably the most difficult part of transitioning out of, of college for myself. Um, I know some of you can relate to what I was saying when we were first starting about class about being a more of an introverted person. I know that that's a stereotype of computer science people. And some of you are not introverted, but um, you know one of the things I learned through through college is that. The, that maybe I'm not as introverted as I understood myself to be, right? I think a best, a better definition of introvert than extroversion is not whether you like to be with people or uh, or alone, but where you get your energy from, right? So I can I can handle being with with people, but that's not where I get energy from. It drains me to to be with people, um, uh, in in large crowd situations. But if I'm with, if, like if I'm at a party or if I'm in a, a group and I find that one or two people and I can kind of get in a small group discussion off in a corner somewhere, that can be a more energizing experience for me because I don't feel overwhelmed by, by all of what's going on in, in the room or in the, in the house or, or, or whatever. Um, so I'm kind of not totally an introvert, but right? I like those those conversations. I like meeting with people, but not a big group situation. Those are kind of more in, in 
intimidating part for me. Um, uh, so, you know, I kind of fit that kind of stereotype of a, a computer science person in, in that way. So, um, you know, I was graduating from Taylor, the kind of the natural, you just open up your dorm room, uh, yell down the hall or walk down to someone and, and, and hang out in their dorm or, or they come and do the same thing. You know, it was very natural and easy to have those relationships. And when I left here, it was it was difficult for me to to make that transition because I didn't know how to be proactive like uh, the, the author talks about in this book. I didn't know how to um, I didn't know how to initiate meaningful contact with other people. Um, I knew that I should attend church, um, but I wasn't in church seven days a week. What was it? And the people I was working with, I was spending much more time with than the people, especially when I first got there, right? I'm still trying to figure out, is this the right church for me? Do I want to, you know, I can't immediately just like be, be weird and hang on someone and say, hey, let me tell you my life story, right? <laughs> that's just kind of, that's creepy, right? Um, to, to do, right? And so how do you, how do you, when you're spending, well, for me, it was much more than 40 hours a week. If you're spending like 60, 70 hours a week in your job, um, and and that's uh, and the people that you're working with don't always have the Christian values that you want to maintain. How do you how do you develop these kinds of relationships? And that's really where most of your time, most of your energy is being spent. Um, for me. And this may be true of you. Just because I wasn't at the office didn't mean that that's where my mental energy was. I was putting a lot of time in the office, but even when I got home, it was like that's what kept going in my mind, and um, that you know I was continuing to ruminate over the problems I was trying to solve. I was um, trying to figure out why things were broken and weren't were fixing. It got to the point where, unfortunately, I was dreaming GDB, which is just not, never a good sign, right? Um, so, uh, but, um, you know, when that's kind of what's filling your head, what that's filling your mind, it's hard to then figure out how do I make meaningful connections with other believers, right? That, that's, and um, so, the, for me, that didn't start happening until probably a year and a half or two years after I left Taylor. I was at Argonne National Laboratory first and, um, and never really settled into a, a good church. I, um, I tried several churches and even some 20 something singles groups at those churches, but never really landed until um, I um, was in, in graduate school. Um, myself. So this is, um, but when that happened, I felt uh, it was a very meaningful experience to start to build those relationships um, when it, when I was in, in grad school. Um, uh, the, the church I attended is where I met with my wife. Um, it's uh, like I said, I think last week when we were talking, um, that the choice to go to grad school was one of the most influential decisions in my spiritual life in, in general because it connected me with a particular church there and connected me with the group of believers that we really invested in deeply. Um, for me, uh, one of one of the things that was really Neat is just, um, it was primarily a 20 something or 30, some 30 something people. Um, the church I went to had, it, let's say it was maybe six or 800 people, but I would guess, I don't know, half to two thirds of those were, were young singles. So it had a very large population as far as um, that goes. Um, 
and not as many older people as, as necessarily the, the book suggests you, you develop those kind of relationships. Um, and, and I understand why your book does that. Um, and, and I don't want to discount that at all. Uh, I will say it's easier to find people at the same stage of life as you than it is people who are at different stages of, of life. Uh, because you're doing the same things, you have natural encounters with each other. Um, so if I think of myself now, uh, compared to when I was back in grad school, there's a lot of things in my life that would just be barriers from interacting with previous self. Uh, I have four kids, and all, this whole week has been going to sporting events for them, right? That, uh, that kind of clogs up in your mind evenings for doing things like small groups. One of the things that is difficult for my wife and I right now is trying to figure out how to continue to be a part of a small group in our church and still being, you know, parents to kids who are in these different activities. It's, a, it's not an easy thing to figure out how to include both of those uh, in our lives. That's, that's an example of a barrier that makes it harder for me um, in general to, to interact with anyone, but especially um, people who don't have kids. Because now I can go to the, the ball field and while my kids are on the field, I can be having conversations, trying to have meaningful conversations while the game is going on and, and sharing our lives with each other during those times. And that becomes a natural connection with, with other people. And so the people I'm naturally connecting with are people with other kids, um, not people who either you know, don't have kids yet or are empty nested with kids who are already left, right? And so that kind of confines my, my schedule to being more naturally with people my age and not younger or older people. And there are similar things um, that, that go, go on um, in, in different stages of life. So it's easier to connect with, with people who have those just natural meetings of, of, of circumstance that, that you encounter. Uh, one of the things that I appreciated then because my group was largely young, young unmarried um, professionals, was that we didn't have a lot of other obligations, shall I say. Um, so our small group uh, met on Thursday evenings. And um, uh, the, the place where we met was was the house of a um, a guy who was the head groundskeeper at a, a local um, golf course. So kind of like uh, a pastor might get um, a a parish home provided for him. This golf uh, caretaker got a house on the grounds that he could live at. So we went there um, and. You know, we had nothing better to do, so we would meet from, I don't know, say start at eight, and he would go to bed, I don't know, 9, 30, 10, because he had to get up at four o'clock in the morning, whatever, to take care of the, the grounds, right? But, but he was, he, he had, a, it was a three bedroom apartment, not apartment, three bedroom house. So he'd go back in one of those rooms and go to sleep, and we'd stay in the other half of the house, and we'd stay till midnight, one or two, or whatever, right? Because we had nothing. That was requiring us to, to go home and put the kids to bed, or um, maybe we had a little bit more job flexibility, maybe come in late to work the next day or something. And so there was small group was like a three or four hour experience for us. And it was really tight and bonding um, because we would worship, we would study the Bible, we'd hang out and goof off, and all the kinds of things that um, hopefully you've been experiencing. Here while well, you're here. I know that most of you guys have to go. Um, but um, that was a very um, helpful 
process for me to get connected to believers outside of uh, graduate school, outside of, of work. Um, and I don't think that would have had the same kind of experience if it was kind of cross-generational. Because me now, when I do a small group, it's like, okay, we've got, we've got 60 minutes, maybe 90 minutes. We can push the babysitter to 90 minutes, right? But we got to get back home, right? It totally changes the dynamic of what uh, a small group meeting is or, or can be because you've got that, that kind of hovering clock uh, on you about having, having to get back home and take care of those, those, those things. Um, so definitely, if you get the chance, you know, keep partners participate in these types of groups that, that have that, that kind of reach. It's, it's totally worth it. Um, yeah, I think the, this chapter, I think, kind of naturally transitions into chapter six. Um, and I, I want to leave the discussion for chapter six for next week, which is finding a church. Um, but, you know, that's where, you know, a large primary source of your uh, Christian relationships are going to be found, right? Where else are you going to, to find them but at some sort of a uh, church or a Christian organization? Uh, <clears throat> so, um, Were there any questions that you guys had as you were reading this text um, that you were hoping to discuss or, or hear comments about? All right. Um, so then, I, I, I could I could talk more, but it, it seemed like you guys were resonating. Um, and I don't, yeah. Yes, oh, uh, I got a question. Uh -huh. um, the book mentioned about the uh, friendship. Uh huh. You know, like you have experience because like you, you came from that, uh, that age. Uh huh. Like uh, when you were in uh, college, uh -huh. you must have, like, you must have like, some very good friendship. Uh huh. And then, like, as a time go by, like, um, some pressure because this period was magic. Right. Like, how, how, how should we like build a correct perspective for for thinking about like the friendship? Ah, uh, how to build a correct a perspective yeah. for for friendship? Like yeah. Proper, like not uh, not too tightly holding on, but not too loosely letting go either. Kind of with some sort of balance there. Yeah. Oh man, I'm not, I don't know if I'm a good person to ask that question. <laughs> um, I um, I kind of err on the side of being willing to let friendships go when I'm not directly involved in them anymore. So when I move, the friendships that I had just kind of actually dissipate pretty quickly. Um, and it's imperative on me to quickly redevelop new friendships in my new place of being. Um, I um, I don't do a good job of maintaining connection to the past, um, and um, even. Even compared to people my age, I use social media much less uh, than than my peers, uh, which is, I think, a, a a easy way to maintain connection with with people that you're not physically present with, right? Because you can you can see updates on Facebook or, or post to Instagram that these these People in your lives in the past, and okay, you can see what's, what's going on uh, with them. But um, 
I have made an intentional choice not to participate in social media on, on that um, ground. I have a Facebook account, um, but for me, it's primarily as a, uh, I use it more like most people use LinkedIn as a way to maintain a couple of professional contacts. Um, so, um, so if I need to connect with an old student or uh, another faculty member from another institution, uh, that's what I use it for. But I, I don't, I've never posted a single thing on Facebook. And I've had an account for over 15 years. <clears throat> um, so, uh, yeah, so, and <clears throat> like I said, that's me. That's an intentional choice. That's not my age. I know that that social media is a much bigger impact on your generation than, than mine. Um, and maybe it's not Facebook, right? With my daughter, it's TikTok. It might be Twitter. I mean, I don't, you know, Instagram, whatever it is. But that's kind of like the, the way that you've grown up at developing connections with people um, and, and maintaining them. So I'm sure some of you know a lot of what's gone on with your friends from, from high school. Um, or if you transferred from one college here, you still know what's going on with some of the people that you made connections with back at your original uh, college institution. Um, and I kind of just, I let that go. Um, um, so, so for th that's why I say I probably err on the side of being too loose with, with friendship. Um, I, uh, I remember having a conversation with one of my roommates in graduate school. Um, so this was before social networking really was a known thing. And um, uh, the conversation basically went along the lines of he knew that um, when he moved out that we were going to stop being friends because of of what I just told you, that I kind of let things kind of dissipate if I'm not a uh, part of people's lives anymore. And that was that was a hurtful conversation for him. He felt unvalued knowing that I could let him go so easily um, in, in the future. Uh, uh, so, you know, uh, so, so that's kind of my disclaimer. Um, but I, I think for me, the reason why I'm this way is because I do very intentionally value what is in my immediate present. Um, and I am really trying hard to avoid things like FOMO. And I feel like, um, I, I feel like for me, being on social media, being on uh, connected that way would, uh, would really, build up those kind of feelings. Like I'd be constantly worrying about, oh, why I should be talking more to this person. I should be involved in this person's life more. I should, uh, in, I, um, and uh, I didn't mean for today to get preachy. Um, uh, it's also why most of you don't see me very actively using my phone. That's, I don't even know where my phone is right now. I think it's in my house. Yeah, it's in my house. Um, but I'm in trouble because I haven't charged it for that week. So um, <clears throat> I really dislike how phones are used in our society. 
um, because I feel like the phone becomes more of an important interaction point than the people that we're actually with. Um, I feel like, you know, if someone calls or texts or does some other sort of form of instant messaging, we interrupt whatever we're in our present with to respond on, on the, the phone to, to that immediate response above or instead of the interaction that we're, the rich interaction that we're having with whomever we're sitting or talking with or, or should be interacting with, but we're all on our phones uh, together or whatever. So I'm a, I'm a big non-fan of the smartphone. Um, and so it, it really taints how I interact with society um, differently than most people. Um, so for me, that's, that's a high priority for me, is who I'm with now, not who I could be with or who I was with or who I'm hoping to be with. And because of that, um, it kind of leads to the natural consequence of me letting friendship go a little bit too easily once I once I leave and, and go somewhere else. But there's consequences, natural consequences of choices and priorities and making that. That's I think one of the consequences for me. But I do think that's the right priority is to, to prioritize the people we are with now, the people that we're interacting with. Um, over others. Um, and as long as as long as I can find other people who are willing to share that with me, the priority, or hopefully are not hurt by um, long periods of um, non-connectivity because I'm not communicating with them on social media, I'm not sending them email or calling them as, as regularly as maybe others do, then I feel like it can be a rich experience in the moment. Um, and hopefully I'm not just going from person to person and this person is only in my life for a week or a month, but that that person is deeply invested in me and I'm deeply invested in them. And so it is a worthwhile relationship for, for both of us. Um, and I'm not just kind of treating everyone as worthless. And I definitely don't want it to sound like I'm using people for, for a friendship. What I'm trying to say is it's, a, it's an investment hopefully a multi-way investment, both investing in each other, um, but knowing that it's not a permanent relationship, but that it's a transient one. I don't know if I answered your question, but... <clears throat> Anyone else? I definitely would talk to other people because I know I am in a minority position in how I interact with people. I'm definitely in a minority position in how I use my phone and how I interact with social media. Um, so maybe, I, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe the rest of the world is, is right. And, um, and they've got different ideas. But that's where, that's where I am on that. All right, you get a good question because I could, emotion is long up in here, so. Um, I didn't have anything more I necessarily wanted to say about this topic. So I wanted to spend a little bit of time 
here um, talking about another um, money topic. I felt like this would be a good time in our uh, sequence to do this. Um, so two weeks ago, I think it was, um, I started talking about taxes. Uh, this week, I want to talk about investments. Normally, I talk about um, budget before investments because doing the budget exercise, I think, can be a strong motivator to be thinking about investments. But I want to give you enough time to work on the budget best. So I'm actually going to push the budget towards the end of the semester. But here's a heads up for you all. There's a budget assignment coming up. And other than the paper, which I, I know is the biggest uh, piece of work in the class, the budget one is the second biggest piece of, of work in the class. And what I'm asking you to do for the budget assignment is actually make a true budget that you could live on post graduation. Um, so I want you to talk to people who, because most of you have never had to live on a full income before. You've been able to benefit from living under your parents' watch, or maybe you've had to budget for maybe three months uh, for a summer at an internship or something like that. Uh, but the pay there is different, and you had different financial obligations having to pay for tuition here than you will have at the graduation. Um, and some parents are really good about teaching their, their kids how to uh, spend money and to think and plan. Some of you have taken personal finance here at Taylor and had to think about that. But uh, from experience, a lot of you don't have a lot of guidance going forward about how to, to budget. Um, and maybe don't even have any, there's a wide range, but there's, there's enough, I would say from experience, who don't have a good appreciation for even what normal expenses are in an everyday living scenario. Um, some, of, some of you know really well, you've had to pay for a lot of your own things or your parents have been really transparent about uh, that. Uh, but the, there's plenty of you who your, your parents have bought their food, have bought their clothes, and really loved on you in that way. Um, and, and as part of that, love have just not remembered to uh, expose you to the, the cost of their love in, in most tangible ways that they loved on you. So we're going to do that. So you need to talk to people and figure out what true expenses are that you're going to encounter. Um, the reason why taxes showed up in this series is because a lot of students had failed to include taxes in their budgets. And they're like, wow, I've got all this money available. This is so awesome. They're like, no, you're in the 20 something, you know, you're in the 24% tax bracket. Start knocking some of it off. And, and all of a sudden it's like, oh, wait, I don't have as much money as I thought I had, right? Um, uh, you know, a lot of people forgot to include, uh, most people remember to include rent. Um, but a lot of people forget to include things like the cost of money to have a car or um, have really unrealistic expectations for um, for those items. Yeah, I can live on $10 a month. You can't, you can't. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I don't even think you could do like a 100% like, um, I don't know, ramen noodle that's all you're eating the entire uh, month and still should be as cheap as $10 a month. It, and I've tried that. I don't know if any of you have tried that um, particular diet. I still can't eat ramen and it's been decades since then. Okay. So, um, so what I'm asking you to do is talk to your parents, you trust them, talk to your, uh, talk to another professor in this department or other department, talk to your hall director, talk to, um, people who you do trust who have wisdom in this area so that I want you to come with a perspective budget when we when we hit that section. Um, 
and it's a fun session um, because you get to see how people that you've been with for the past three and a half years have completely different priorities. All right. So, with that said, we're going to talk about investment. Um, and just like uh, budget, my experience says that some of you have already been investing and you, you know everything that we're going to talk about today because you um, learned it. And some of you don't have any knowledge of where to start when we talk about investments and, and how to go about investing or uh, when we talk about some terms, what they, what they even mean. Uh, so, um, if I sound basic, um, please bear with me um, because um, I am intentionally starting at the, the beginning. All right. Um, so uh, let's start. Put this up right here. All right. Um, whenever someone starts talking about investment, these kind of terms start get, getting thrown around. Um, and so I want to make sure that we're on the same page with what, what they mean. All right. So let's start uh, with um, stocks. Can someone help explain what a stock is? Yeah. A portion of the company's value. A portion of the company's value. So if you own a stock in Amazon, what does that mean? Essentially. It essentially means since it's a portion of that company's values, that you are a part owner of that company. Now, with a company as large as Amazon, they've got millions, hundreds of millions of stock. So if you only have one, and let's make the numbers easy, and there are 100 million shares, but one stock is, is a share, you own one 100 million of the company. You don't really have too much value in that single share. Right? You're not Jeff Bezos, uh, who owns a lot of those shares. Um, but a stock is ownership in that company. So why would you own stock? What is what is the point of owning stock other than everyone tells you that it's a good idea? Yeah, it's easy. As the company grows in value, your piece of that company therefore inherently grows in value. All right. So if if the company um, gets bigger, hopefully you're now it's now worth more. Right. And so that that has two ways that that can help you. One is you can end up selling that hopefully at a profit because now the the company is worth more than it was when you bought. Uh, you're part of it, so you uh, will sell your part of it for more than you you bought it for. But it also means that since you own the company, everything about that company is partly yours, right? The profit that comes in from that company, the the assets, whether it's the building or the computers or the uh, manufacturing equipment, or the paper and pencils. Um, that's, you own a tiny little sliver of that, right? Um, and so, so the company has money coming in. And the company has to decide what to do with the money that it, comes to, what, that it receives. And broadly speaking, there's two things that a company can do with the with its profits. Number one is it can give those profits to the owner. 
and you say, okay, we just made a million dollars and we have a million owners, so each owner can have a dollar. Or we made a billion dollars and each owner can have a thousand dollars. So that's one, profit sharing. So companies that are older, that tend to be mature, um, will do this. And, and that in a stock world is what's called a dividend. Okay, so basically, if you own a stock, the company says, here, we'll give you $5 for every stock that you own, for every share that you own. We'll give you $2.50. We'll give you $50. I mean, I don't know what it is. Maybe probably shares are in the company, depending on how much profit the company made, all these kinds of things. Um, so you can imagine if you're older and you have retired, if you own a bunch of stocks with dividends, that can almost be like you're getting paid a salary from, from your stock. So these can be really interesting. Uh, stocks that have dividends can be really interesting to retired people because they can own the stock, they still own the company, and money is coming. They don't have to sell the stock in order to get the money, which is which is really nice. So that's option number one that a company can do with its profits. But I don't know if any of your parents own a company themselves, but I'll bet you that if they do, you see option two more frequently. That the that your parents have to take the money that comes in from that company and they have to pour it back into the company. They have to reinvest that money maybe to help it grow more or to um to buy new equipment or to increase the the salaries of the, the, the people that they're, they're paying for um to buy inventory um or whatever right so you have to reinvest that money back in so a company that is smaller that has room to grow will more frequently do that with the profit They'll say, hey, we know we can grow. We know there's this, we just started this product and we're only selling a thousand of them right now. But if we take our profits and put it into marketing, or we take our profits and expand our manufacturing capability, or if we take our profits and, um, and wisely use them, we're going to grow from selling a thousand widgets to selling a million widgets, right? In our that our company is going to be worth so much more, a thousand times more than it, than it is now, right? And so small and growing companies are more likely to do the, the latter thing with their profit, reinvest it back in the company. They're not going to tend to have dividends. Okay, so um, so these tend to be, I will say tend to be mature companies. versus new or growth oriented companies. So an example of a company that tends to give dividends is a bank. Because what are they going to do with their money? Their profits. Yeah. They have only so much money that they can give out in loans or to make and so if they get more profits than they know what to do with they're just going to give it back to the owners of the bank and say you figure out what to do with it or um oil companies you know when they make billions of dollars selling oil they know how much money they need to spend exploring and continuing to dig wells and stuff and find new oil but if they make even more profit than that, what are they going to do? Uh, we don't know. So we'll just give it back to the owners of the, of the company. They, 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 they. But new companies, startup companies, technology companies tend to have a lot of reinvestment. We're not, we know we can grow, get bigger on the internet, you know, add this new feature. Be, um, Become the next 
whatever um, technology company you want to, to emulate, Facebook, Google, Amazon, Netflix, whatever. Okay. So stocks, you buy them because you think the I think the reason why you should buy stocks is because you believe the company is going to be worth more in the future than it is now. Either in the combination of the company itself or the company plus the dividends that you receive. Not everyone agrees with me. Some people treat the stock market like, um, like it's kind of an advanced gambling thing. Ooh, no. Ah, that, that's fancy. I'm going to buy that and I'm going to you know, roll the dice and see if this company is going to, if I can, the stock goes up. Not that the company is going to be more valuable, but I just want the stock to go up. You know, you know, <clears throat> I'm going to gamble. Um, I knew people who were like, I'm going to gamble that this, this pandemic is going to get really bad. And I'm going to gamble that the stocks are going to go down as a result of it. So, um, so I'm going to operate a certain name stock market. You know, I'm going to gamble that, um, I don't know, that the election is going to go a certain way and the stock market is going to be really excited about it and they're going to go up and go forward. I'm not a big fan of treating stocks that way. It, uh, you're, as, you're as likely to make money as you are to lose money in, your, in those cases. Um, and I don't think that's a wise, wise way to, to steward your money. But that's available to you if you want to gamble. High risk, high reward. We'll get to that. All right. How are stocks then different than bonds? Because if you hear investors talk long enough, you will hear this term as well. I don't know what a bond is. You're not afraid to um, answer, and so it means you don't actually know the answer. A bond is like a loan to a company. So when you buy, when you get a bond from a company, the way you get that is instead of a stock where you give money to an owner and you buy their part of the company, here you're giving money to the company itself. But after some period of time, you're going to get that money back. And just like every other loan in the world, in the duration, you're going to be getting interest on that money. Okay? So you don't own this company when you have a bond. You just loan that company your money, and you expect to be given that money back after a certain period of time, and you expect interest payments on it as well. So in a certain way, bonds can be similar to dividends. Right, because you've got that flow of money coming back to you on a regular basis, maybe every month, maybe every quarter, and you're going to get an interest payment on that loan. Okay. <clears throat> Why would you do a bond? Why would you um, buy a bond from, from a company? Why would they be cheaper than a stock? Okay, so so there's a um, there's a lower bound than how much you can make here, right? If you give the company a thousand dollars and they are able to invest it wisely and make a million dollars, you don't give a portion of that million dollars, right? You only get that thousand dollars plus a little bit of, of profit, back, right? So, so that's one reason to get it a little bit cheaper.
Another reason is maybe you don't foresee that company growing. If you don't think that company is going to be more worth more money in the future, maybe buying that company is not a great idea. But at the same time, you might still think that company is going to be around and is going to be able to pay off the bond. So this is a more sure um, investment in, in that scenario. Who is the number one bond issuer by far? I mean, it's not even close. Yes. Uh, they are oftentimes called treasuries. Right. So you're rolling the government money. Why does the government need money when we're already paying the taxes? Yes. Because of Bush and Obama. Uh, no, unfortunately, we've been doing bonds since much before that. <laughs> because <laughs> Congress is incompetent. <laughs> that makes it worse. Yes. <laughs> Be, the, the reason why is because the government has a budget and says we're going to spend this amount of money, right? And it's anticipating that it's going to get the revenue through taxation, but it might not come in a steady flow, right? More people, uh, new class, more people work between Thanksgiving and Christmas than any other time of year. So guess what? There is more taxes that come in during November and December than during other times of the year, right? Because you have more people who are employed. But the budget, the yearly budget, doesn't reflect those fluctuations in employment. The yearly budget is whatever amount of money divided by 12 or divided by 52, you know, if it's a weekly or monthly budget. And so if not enough tax money came in yet this month, bless you, but we're expecting it to come in next month, the government needs a loan to be able to pay for the things that it's promised to pay for, right? So we sell bonds, as a way to um, be able to have a more predictable inflow of cash. All right. So stocks and bonds are the number, the one and two most um, straightforward way that you can invest your money. Either buy a company or lend it money. All right. Now, you can get creative. You don't have to lend a company money. You can buy someone else's bond from them. Okay, so <clears throat> if uh, Let's see here right next to me. If Joe decided to buy a thousand dollar bond from the US government, I can say, Hey, I know you're kind of in a pinch. Will you sell me your bond for 975 bucks? Right? And Joe can decide to do that. And then when the loan is done, instead of the US government paying Joe the thousand dollars that they lent him. They would pay me a thousand dollars because I've got the bond now. I bought it from him. And in the meantime, I also get all those interest. So maybe he paid, no, no, no. I know you're getting those interest payments. You need to pay me a thousand twenty-five bucks, right? And there's a market where you where you cannot just um, give money directly to the companies, but you can buy bonds that have already been um, issued 
to individuals by these government nonprofit and, and industry organizations. I think Taylor has one if you really wanted to buy it from the market. All right. So these are the ways that you can invest. Yes, David. So I have two questions. Um, first one, are bonds fixed interest rate or is it like between and something? Um, bonds are fixed interest rate and for a fixed duration. Um, so what fluctuates is not the interest rate, but the amount that you have to pay for a bond, right? So imagine right now, if you want to buy a U.S. bond, the interest rates are insanely low. In fact, the the um, Federal Reserve is trying to hold the interest rates near zero percent. So the, they're extremely, extremely low. You're almost getting no interest off, off of it whatsoever. Um, but they had started to raise prior to the pandemic. They were, get, they were getting up to like two and a half, three percent. So imagine, Daisy, that you had been really interested in bonds at the beginning of the year in January and you had bought a bond um, that was giving 2% interest rate. Right? That bond is more appealing to me than the bond that I can buy right now from the US government at almost 0%. So um, you, the bond that you bought is going to be more expensive than the same bond with the same dollar value um, on it that the US government is offering right now, because I'm going to get interest, more interest off of it than one I could buy right now. The opposite happens if whenever it happens, and it will eventually happen, the interest rates go up, right? Now your bond looks like, why do I want that? I could just buy a new bond and have a bunch of interest come my way. And so you're going to have to give me a discount if I want to buy your bond. It's not worth it to, to me to buy your bond now, right? So the prices of the bonds on the open market go up and down in response to what the current interest rate that I can sell a, a, a brand new bond for is. And they reflect that to try to balance out some past bond and its stated interest rate with the current uh, or upcoming future bonds that, that's on its way. Yes. And that interest rate you're talking about, is that paid off by month, by year, or by bond? Uh, it's stated on the bond itself, what the what the um, period of the interest rate is. And do they pay that to you while you still have the bond? Yes. Or do you do it all at once and pay the they, they pay you the interest um, at some periodic rate. Usually, if it's a U.S. bond, that will be quarterly. So every three months, you will get an interest rate uh, payment. Uh, but it, it could be monthly, um, or it, I, I, technically, I suppose it could be yearly. But I think quarterly is the most common payback on the, the, the interest that you will find. Most uh, uh, yeah. So let's say I like buy bonds in Taylor. Taylor doesn't buy into the cover and ship down. What happens to my bond? It's uh, it's worth what you can sell to someone else for. <laughs> and how much do you think someone else is going to buy that for? Nothing, right? Yeah. Well, they pay back some of it. So, like, let's say, like, the uh, agency comes in, liquidates all of Taylor's assets. Does some of that money go to bond holders? Yes, yes, because the bond is an obligation. It's a debt obligation. That the the company has, <laughs> so bankruptcy deals with with that as part of it. That's why companies like Moody and S and P and Fitch exist. They rate basically every company that possibly could issue a bond. They say this is how likely we think this company is to bank be bankrupt. Right, and they have this really complicated rating scale, but that I totally don't understand. Uh, uh, like, and um, and the more safe you are, the lower an interest rate you have to offer people. 
Why is that? Yeah. Because they're less risk than buying the bond. So why should that make a lower interest rate? You're absolutely right, because but I want you to bring it all the way there. It's more likely that you'll have to pay it. Yeah, so it's more likely that you will pay it. Yeah. And so what's what's it going to do? That's going to increase the number of people who are willing to buy your bond. Right? Yeah. Since there's more ba basic economics, since there's a greater demand for that bond, it's going to lower the cost um, that that person has to um, sell their or because they can they can play multiple buyers off. Well, if you're not going to buy my bond for that rate, well, I can find him to buy it or her to buy it, right? And so you're like, oh, well, I'll lower my interest rate a little bit, right? So the more people who are willing to buy the bond, the lower it's going to drive the interest rate for that company. So the more safe it is, the lower the interest rate. The more risky it is the less you're going to find people who are willing to buy that bond. And so you might only be able to find one person who's willing to sell your bond and buy your bond. And so they kind of got you over the barrel, right? And they're like, oh, you want me to buy your bond? I want 20%. I don't trust that you're going to give it back. So you need to really pay me a high interest rate because it's my only chance of maybe making it back. Right? Just if I buy, I sell you bond and you bond and you bond, there's a one in five chance of you all bankrupting, I need really high interest rates because one of those bonds is going to not pay back. Right? Higher risk, higher interest rate. Lower risk, lower interest rate. Okay? Now, most people do not directly buy stocks. Most people do not directly buy bonds. Okay? Part of the reason for that is because most people don't have this tons of disposable income. They can just like, yeah, I can put five thousand dollars here and ten thousand dollars here and twenty thousand dollars here. Um, they just don't have that kind of free cash available to do it. They're like, I got ten extra dollars a month. I got fifty dollars extra a month that I can spend on investment, but I can't even buy like one, you know, one tenth of a Google. A, stock for, for that amount, right? So they need some other mechanism for investing in, um, in companies. Um, so there's this idea of a mutual fund. How many people have heard of mutual fund? Okay, good. A mutual fund is basically another company all that company does is own stocks or bonds or other investments. And so when you buy a share of a mutual fund, you're buying its investments. So you have some manager of a mutual fund and their job is to take the money from all the owners of the mutual fund and, and invest it wisely. Now the mutual fund will advertise ahead of time, this is our investment strategy. We think that a really good investment strategy is to buy technology stock. Or we think a really wise investment strategy is to um, buy international companies. Or we think a really wise investment strategy is um, uh, to, to, to buy an index or basically sample all the different companies that, that exist. Um, or on and on and on. And so then when you're a regular uh, investor like me, you'll say, hmm, I like that investment strategy. I'll put 10% of my money into that mutual fund. But uh, I also like this investment strategy, so I'll put 25% of my money into this mutual fund and so forth. And so you you can invest in particular strategies. You can invest in, in specific managers. Typically, they charge a fee for doing the service. <clears throat> and um, the idea is I don't I don't have time to spend figuring out every single company which one's gonna grow, 
and get bigger and be worth my time investing in versus which ones are going to um, shrink or lose their value over time. For me personally, my energy and time is in my family and in my job, and I don't have leftover time and energy to do that. So I'm going to pay this guy or girl who's managing this fund to do that work. That's what their job is to do, is to talk to all these companies, figure out what they do, figure out why they're going to grow or not grow, look really deeply into their financial aspects of their company, understand how not just their company works, but the field that they're in is working and how they position their company in the field. They'll sit down and, and interview the CEO and the, this mutual fund manager has access to these companies that I don't have because they've got hundreds of millions or billions, maybe, you know, let's say that, hundreds of millions or billions of dollars that are invested in these mutual funds. And so the, these companies are like, hey, yeah, you want to invest in us? Yeah, let's, I'll talk to you for it. You, that's worth my time. But if I, me, I want to talk to that CEO, yeah, thanks for your five bucks, right? I don't have a seat at the table. These mutual fund managers literally have seats at the table. They might even be on the boards of directors at some of these companies, that they basically bought their way into these companies and they're influencing how these companies work because of that. So for me, it's worth my fee to pay someone else to do that job for me. So long as that fee is reasonable, right? The, the fee can often distinguish between a, a mediocre and a high quality mutual fund. Um, and, and so um, I wouldn't say just use the fee and pick the, the funds with the lowest fee, but you might want to eliminate funds that have fees that are 10 times higher than every other fund. It should make you question why they're able to charge such a high fee, right? So this is a wonderful thing. You can invest in this mutual fund, and this manager might have a um, group of investors that they employ to help them do their job well. Yes? I wonder if I might spend it with our friend who was doing direct to camera for the board. Sure, I can do that. Thank you. There we go. All right. It should be flipped for him, right? That's yeah. the weird thing about the camera token. All right. Um, so mutual funds are. You can think of them, if you want to think in computer science terms, they're containers of investment. Okay. So all they do is hold other investments and, and you can contain them. That they can be stocks, they can be bonds, they could be real estate, they could be gold. Um, soon I think you can get Bitcoin one. Um, you know, so um, yeah, you can you can invest in that, and you're all investing in that together. Right? Yes. Uh, that's a good question. I'm trying to figure it out myself. My 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 short answer to that is I think cryptocurrencies are the future of currency. I just don't know which one. So it's a, to me, it's a very risky investment. And so I definitely would not make that your primary investment. Um, the other thing I want to talk about is you've probably heard these terms before. What is a 401k or a 503b? Yeah, 
these are retirement um, containers. Okay, so let's get back to taxes here. Why we had to talk about taxes before we could talk about investment. These are named after the particular part of the tax code. So if you go to IRS section 401, subsection K, you will get all the legal requirements behind this particular investment option. Or if you go to section 503, subsection B, you'll get them about that. The difference between these two literally is this uh, is what a for-profit com for company can offer its employees, and this is what a non-profit company can offer its employees. But if you look at the language of these two things, they're essentially equivalent to each other. Um, so when you invest in a 401k or 503b, they are, like I put here, kind of containers, and you can put mutual funds in them. You could, if it's set up properly, you can put stocks or bonds in them. And they, um, anything you invest that you put in your 401k or your 503b uh, is um, <clears throat> initially tax-free. In other words, it reduces your um, gross income. So it's as if you never made that money to the US government. So if you invest, if you make $50,000, but you put $2,000 into your 401k, if the government says, oh no, you really only made $48,000. Right, because those $2,000 didn't show up as the income. Until, you take the money out of that container. At which point it shows up as your income. Okay? So all the money that you made, all the interest that you made, all the compounding that the investments made, that becomes taxable. Okay? Because the government isn't that nice. <clears throat> it wants to see its taxes eventually. All right? Um, and to make sure you have a mandatory that it eventually will get its money. If you get to a certain age, you have to start taking the money out. You just can't keep it there forever. <clears throat> so that right now is 70 and a half. Who knows what it'll be in the future? Maybe it'll be older, maybe it'll be younger. That seems like forever to me. Right? Like 70 and a half. Right? I mean, that's like you just die before that, right? Which is good. But um, right, that's forever. But for the government, that's nothing, right? So they're thinking the government's thinking long term. Hey, when you're 70 and a half and you've got you've built up hopefully like a million dollars in this thing. Now you're now we're really going to tax you, right? Now we really got we got the the, the good money, right? And we'll we'll make it back in spades later. Yes. That must be blue bags, so like family gets it. Yes, your family gets it, and your family has to withdraw money from it based on their age. Yes. So. Um, <clears throat> So eventually it's going to be pulled out. It's not going to stay there forever. Okay. So these are company sponsored plans. So usually when, when you are getting a job offer this fall and this spring, the companies that you're working for should explain to you what 401k or 503 B plans they offer to you. They might say, hey, we contract out with Fidelity or Vanguard or um, any number of these other companies, and you can buy one of these five or one of these 50 or one of these five million, I don't care. One of these sets of, of mutual funds, so that's your option, and you can put it into your 401k. And it's like you 
get to build up all that money tax free and you only have to pay the taxes at the end. It reduces your overall income as far as US government is concerned. Um, and it's really nice. A lot of companies will have some sort of matching thing. They'll say like, if you put in a thousand dollars, we'll put in a thousand dollars. Or if you put in 2000, we'll put in a uh, thousand. Uh, you know, they'll tell you what the matching goes. Take advantage of that matching, man. That's free money. Like, even if even if you put a thousand dollars in and you bought the crappiest mutual fund in the world and it lost what, a quarter of its value, if they just matched your money, you still made a ton of money, right? It is so hard not to make money on matching that you're giving up that free money. Do not do it. Take the free money and run, uh, right? <laughs> it is so worth it, okay? So most companies will say, we'll match up to this amount, some percentage of your income or some flat fee. If at all possible, do that. Meet, get that free money uh, for yourself. Well, most of them, right? Just think of it as um, a higher total pay with a lower uh, take home pay. All right. There are other options that aren't through your company. Um, if you've ever heard of IRA, individual retirement account, these are other containers. These are retirement containers. The difference is it's not set up by your company. It's set up by you. And the, the government says, we want you to invest money now for your retirement because the last thing we want you to do is be broke when you're retired and us have to pay for all your health care and your food and your lodging, right? If you pay for it, then we don't have to pay for it, right? So it's, it's, it's worth it to us. So if a standard IRA is like a 401k, anything that you put in it is tax free, just like the 401k, okay? But it's not controlled by your company. So you can put almost any investment you can think of in one of these things. Here, you can only put what your company sponsors. Here, you can put anything, literally almost anything that you can think of. It's crazy. Okay. There's another option, and then I'm done. I know what's on the side. There's a Roth IRA. You may have heard of that term. A Roth IRA is kind of strange because what you do instead of putting your money in before taxes, and then you have to pay taxes on everything you make, the Roth IRA is the exact opposite. You pay taxes on your money first, then you put it into the Roth IRA, and you never have to pay taxes again, no matter how much it grows. Okay, so a Roth IRA is super awesome for most of you right now because you're paying taxes, I'm guessing, at pretty low tax rates. Not too many students have high tax rates, I'm just a guess of mine. Um, so you're, you're paying low tax on your money now, and then hopefully by the time you retire, your tax rate has increased, not because the government is it has increased tax rates in general, but because you've made more income and you move yourself up in the tax rate uh, ladder, right? And so you pay the low tax rate and you don't have to withdraw at a high tax rate. And all that compounding that is done is free. You never have to, to pay another nickel to, to Uncle Sam for, for that. So this is just a starter, get your, Sell so, uh, kind of a taste of investments. I haven't even barely scratched the surface of what you can do with investments, but hopefully now you can at least say, oh, I, I have a concept of what a mutual fund is or what a 401k or, or an IRA is. I need to learn more about that. I'm gonna talk to a financial analyst or I'm gonna talk to someone who is gonna help me Good, and dig deeper into that. But you have to know this right now. This is something you can't ignore. Because this could affect, if you've got two good job offers, this may be like the distinguishing feature between those two job offers. 
And I don't want you to make your decision solely based on money, but if you like both of the options, yeah, look into these kind of details. And, and it helps you understand how much that company values you. They're putting a money, they're actually putting a literal dollar value on, on you and the contribution you have to the company. Sorry for going extra long. Um, chapter six for next week. Make sure you're preparing for the um, senior freshman advice session. All right. Talk to you guys later.